Well, Rich Arnott's our guest today for our show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. So you've been with me a number of years and been uh, such a strong part of the company. You're our managing director of alternative investments. That means you know everything there is to know about alternative investments. Well, I do not know everything about alternative <laughs> investments, but uh, that is the area that uh, I have uh, spent a lot of my time in my career, over my career in, um, in um, looking at and reviewing and, and following. Well, I know you have helped us. You helped a lot of our clients, um, you know, navigate things, and uh, uh, especially as we've gone through some of the difficult times with uh, when they introduced COVID to the country and to the world. We were able to be with sponsors who navigated that well, and um, I credit you with a lot of that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, to start off, just kind of a review of the alternative investments in general, uh, 2023 uh, and coming into 2024. Um, you, you always give me such great uh, recaps. Um, the uh, 2023 uh, sales were strong. I mean, we've, we've talked in our podcasts and our videos about um, how the democratization of alternative investments is not just for the ultra wealthy anymore. It's not high net worth, $30 million and up, uh, but there's this huge shift of regular folks getting in to alternative investments. Right. And that seems to be continuing. Um, your uh, your note said that in 2024 is uh, so far we're at a, a 33% rise over 2023. Correct. Yep. So uh, if uh, 2023 was a uh, was a uh, a good year, uh, the alternative space saw about a 75.6 billion dollar investment in alternative investments, uh, and that works out to be about a on a monthly run rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so far this year, uh, we've exceeded that where we're right now on a monthly run rate uh, doing about eight and a half billion dollars on a month. And, uh, and what are the most common ways? I know we look at BDCs, interval funds. We'll, we'll explain. There's so many acronyms in here, but um, uh, for instance, uh, non-traded REITs, you know, what, what are they? I really want uh, to keep educating our, our viewers on what are alternative investments, all the different types of them. Yep. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Sure, yeah, so alternative in, is, is kind of a, a catch-all phrase that is used in the industry. So it is, it's an alternative investment that is different from just the typical stock and bond allocation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, that, in that net, that wide net, you have non-traded REITs, mm -hmm versus the publicly traded REITs, and, the, and, and there's pros and cons for both in, in someone's portfolio. And so publicly traded would mean a ticker on the stock exchange. On the stock you can exchange, go in and buy it, sell it. And it's, it's almost like owning a stock itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it go, you know, that, that price goes up and down, and, um, and you can sell it to just like, like you own a stock. You own a share of that stock that basically owns a percentage of real estate, also some debt, and mm -hmm. owns some cash just for that liquidity that they have as well. The benefit of a private non-traded REIT is in the sense is that uh, you don't have that liquidity. You do have some quarterly liquidity. They call that the share of a purchase program, and mm -hmm. you're, you're limited on how, many sh uh, how much you can actually get out if there was a run on the bank. Well, uh, and I really want to get into that. We'll do that later in the show, the idea of risk, because that, uh, that directly goes to risk. Yep. You know, illiquidity. It's an illiquid investment. Right. So. But, at the, at, but the, the main thing is on a publicly traded REIT, the yields are a little bit less than on a private uh, okay. uh, non-traded REIT. Those yields usually are a little bit higher. Okay. And, and why, why people why are looking... That? Well, because you don't have that uh, fluctuation of the market, okay. you don't have that uh, fluctuation of the liquidity on okay. happening on a daily basis. Because you know, on a non-traded REIT, you own you own a hard asset, you own some real estate, right? Yeah. And so, it if it's really hard in the sense if you own, let's say, three multifamily complexes mm -hmm. in your portfolio, and all of a sudden you have someone knocking on your door to say, "I need to liquid my investment." It's hard to sell that property right. just in day one, so you have some other investments in there mm -hmm. that can provide that type of quarterly liquidity that uh, that, that the portfolio would needs. I almost wish they would break out the uh, define it as investment risk and liquidity risk. 
Correct. Because that really would be, I think, more more helpful to investors deciding where they want to place their money. Correct. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, within the stock market, you know, emotions run with mm-hmm. the investors. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people do knee-jerk reactions and get out at the wrong time. And, yeah. and you know, you, you, it's, it's, you don't see that in the non-traded or private area sure. in the alternative space as much. Because of the, because uh, you you know you just can't hit a switch and liquidate your entire portfolio. Well, I know with alternative investments, we believe that every uh, investor should be thinking in terms of having a stock market allocation, an alternatives allocation, and a principal protected allocation. And that way, we that's how we rebalance across what we call the asset stack. Uh, with alternatives, there's four things that we're looking for. We want to have income. We want tax efficiency. We want that low correlation to the stock market. So when everybody's hair is on fire and they're they're just dumping stocks and selling at the worst time, that does that not part of the alternative investments. And of course, the fourth thing is we want growth. Mm-hmm. So we get all of those or, or historically a potential for all of those with the alternative investments. Yeah, absolutely. What are BDCs? BDCs are, uh, that's a term that's out there. It's called business development corpor- uh, companies, mm-hmm. uh, corporations. And uh, BDCs is a, uh, and it's, you know, it takes a pool of investments and it invests in both small, medium-sized, middle market uh, companies uh, for lending. So they do middle market lending. And so uh, a lot of those small to medium-sized mom and pop companies can't go out to, you know, credit unions or Mm -hmm. banks or things of that nature. So they need all sources of capital. Mm -hmm. And these BDCs come in and offer that type of capital needed for these companies to operate. And they can do it either through some type of a debt, through MES debt on their capital stack, a variety of different ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, starting to sound technical here, MES debt on the capital stack. Yeah. You know. Well, I won't. Yeah, <laughs> I won't do that. But so, at the end of the day, they are lending money to these mm-hmm. small, medium-sized companies, uh, and they then in, get, get a yield in return for that lending of that money okay. for that debt, and uh, pass that on to investors. Interval funds. Interval funds, yeah. So an interval fund is a closed-end fund uh, that shares don't do not trade on the market. Uh, so it's a little bit different than an open-end fund, and uh, they invest in a variety of uh, of, of offerings, uh, things, uh, mm-hmm. alternative investments. And uh, instead, they go back to their shareholders on a quarterly basis and buy back shares, the ones that need to have liquidity. Mm-hmm. And there's certain percentages that they can buy back. But the company itself buys back at NAV, mm-hmm. the net asset value, of the shares uh, for investors that need that liquidity. Okay. And as with any of these, I, I guess we should, in every show we have to say at some point, that most of the things we're talking about are only available to what the SEC defines as accredited investors. <laughs> accredited <laughs> investor is that you have certain metrics, you either have more than a million of assets, not including your primary residence, or 200,000 single or 300,000 as a couple for uh, income. Just a gross income. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So that is the SEC's way of uh, protecting the public. Now, I don't know about you, but a million dollars doesn't buy what it used to. We, uh, <laughs> uh, a home in mid 90s, you know, build it for 250,000 and now it's a million dollar home. It's the same box, Rich. It's keeping you warm, keeping you dry, place to keep your stuff. Is it really worth a million? Well, I think it says more about inflation and what's happened to the devaluation of the dollar than anything else. Yeah, and I and I think that uh, the accreditation uh, has been out there for a long time and 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 those um, those rules have been out there for a long time and mm-hmm. I know that they're reviewing those rules to see if they need to be changed at all. Yeah. But uh, I think the more people that we could offer alternative investments just to, you know, either the non-accredited or the accredited mm-hmm. um, is going to be a benefit to everybody just on their own allocation or their own portfolio. I think so, too. It, it really used to be just the uh, the area for the um, wealthy or ultra-high net worth, but with the, uh, like I said earlier on, the democratizing mm-hmm. of alternative investments, everybody should have the opportunity not to have their money volatile in the stock market. Well, and really where this became in focus was about 15, 20 years ago where you see these large universities, their endowments, Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Yale endowment, they publish basically their total returns at the end of the year and what they invest in. Yeah. And they were getting double digit returns and people were kind of scratching their heads saying, well, how did you do that yeah. through the stock and bond so market? Consistently. And so they were actually doing a percentage of their investments into alternatives mm -hmm. as well. So then it started to branch out from not just the endowments doing that, mm -hmm. then it started to uh, go down to family offices. And now we're all the way down to accredited investors yeah. now to really investing. And hence one of the reasons why the overall industry is up about 33% compared to last year, just it's because amazing. more people are allocating their overall portfolio, not to stocks and bonds, but a greater amount to mm -hmm. alternatives, which is protects you from the swing of the market. Well, and that's one of the things we help clients with is to uh, familiarize them with alternatives. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about risk and due diligence, uh, one of the areas where you've really, you've really helped uh, protect our, a lot of our clients that way. Um, the uh, uh, different sectors, I know that was a trend that's really changed. And again, since they introduced COVID, um, we're looking at uh, sectors that are doing really well. I think you're saying that industrial, multifamily, and senior housing are the strongest ones right yeah, now? Yeah, so the top three selling right now within the 1031 exchange market, the top three are industrial, mm -hmm. multifamily, and senior housing. And um, um, industrial and multifamily have always been one of the you know, either one or two uh, top selling. But I found it interesting that senior housing has jumped up to number three now. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with just the demographics of the United States, what's mm -hmm. going on with the aging yeah. of the population, and that the, the demand for senior housing and, uh, and those types of assets are being put on um, as a lot of people are getting older and need senior, you know, uh, either assisted living or memory care facilities uh, well, that are out there. This year, 2024, is uh, peak 65. You've heard about peak oil, you know, peak this, peak that. This is the mac the year where the maximum number of baby boomers are turning 65. It will be in 2024. And so what do they need? Senior living, memory care, uh, a lot uh, as it comes down to individual investors. Um, they're looking at portfolios of properties that they've accumulated, rental properties. The, the rental stock in this country, which is where people live, right? Uh, sing single family, condos, apartments, multifamilies. The rental stock, we're told by the press that that's the big bad corporations, you know, have come in and they swooped up and there's no, you know, they're buying it all. Uh, roughly 5% of the rental stock in the United States is owned by big industrial corporations. Oh, yeah. Two thirds of it, 60% or so, is owned by mom and pop. That's correct. And it's just regular folks. Yep. And now these regular folks are owning these regular properties. And we've got an entire project called Landlord Rescue. It's landlordrescue.com that is analyzing the the shifts. Legislatures across the country are diminishing the landlord rights and increasing tenants' rights. So um, I won't get off on that now, but that's a huge, huge trend, which is scary for baby boomers who have acquired and put together a portfolio in the interest of saying, okay, I'm gonna work on this, maintain it, and in my old age, I'm gonna be able to have this and it's gonna be paying my income. Yep. And it's gonna be great, passive income. Well, if somebody was interested in that, how would they find out more about you know the program that you've established, that we've established here at this company? Well, they can go to landlordrescue.com and uh, we've got a short video on there that mm -hmm. uh, that starts to tell them about it and explain the yep. the ins and outs but best way is just to uh, you know get get our get their email to us and they'll get regular information from us yep. um, because it really is we, we think that if somebody is has uh, you know property the design is to be passive income and if they're spending their nights and their weekends if they're planning their trips about being back in town when the lease is due so that they can clean out and repaint and refurb it, refurb it and get it ready for the next one um, then it's, it's you know what what kind of lifestyle are they letting their properties demand of them instead of them demanding a lifestyle from their investments? Correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's one of the main reasons I think that we've seen a run up in overall Delaware statutory trust sales mm -hmm. over the last five years is that there's a huge shift of people that are tired of the of the three T's, mm -hmm. uh, taxes, trash, and toilets, and caring for all that 
and they want their they want to they want their money to work for them, mm-hmm. not their, them working for yeah. their money. Well, we feel that if you're working hard for your passive income, then that's called a job. <laughs> you know, if right. you if you got to work to to bring it in. So you can also add, let's see, uh, termites and. Uh, uh, um, Something else that I knew. There were like five or six T's last time we we <laughs> dug through them. So anyway, that's that's a good uh, kind of a good background. So industrial. Um, touch briefly on industrial. Is that are we talking big smokestack industries? Yeah. So industrial. There, there's a there's a variety of it. So it could be the uh, it could be an Amazon distribution facility. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be that you own that real estate. You have a investment grade tenant that has signed a long-term lease that pays monthly mm-hmm. and uh, you are a beneficial owner of that property. Um, it could be a distribution facility. It could be a warehouse facility for a Costco, a Walgreens, mm-hmm. uh, a Walmart as well. So it's, it's so there's a variety of different, there's flex industrial mm-hmm. now where you have an industrial with multiple tenants okay. that are in there and they, they, they have different companies and different sectors, different mm-hmm. services that they provide as well. Do you think uh, it would be um, in this age, when I think of industrial, I think of uh, the, the old big motors and belts and steam driven, you know, uh, machines. I think of Henry Ford's, you know, manufacturing line. Right. And I, I think of smokestacks and dirt. Um, but manufacturing computers, that's industrial. Chips, that's industrial. Yeah. Biotechnology, I mean, all of this stuff. Medical, would yeah. you, you know, consider a, a medical office as, or, or manufacturing of medical products being industrial? So life science, yeah. So if a yeah. life science, if they manufacture the, you know, the medicine or the drugs and they do mm-hmm. the research and manufacturing and yep. distributing that, then, then that would be deemed as industrial as well. And that's strong because, uh, you know, back again during COVID, we found that we were not manufacturing critical things here in this country we need. Right. So I know life science has gotten a big boost from that right. as well. And that's one of the benefits, I think, too, in alternative investments is that you can pick your sector, which is industrial, Mm -hmm. but you can really narrow it down to to either do you want life science, you want distribution, you want manufacturing, Mm -hmm. what type of sector do you want within the industrial Mm -hmm. space, and you can narrow that down as well for a variety of different investors. Well, well, we'll get to your famous three Qs in a little bit and talk about the uh, how how you can diversify. You've got to get a portfolio of a handful of rentals and what that might translate into at, yep. at some point. There's an interesting statistic that, uh, that you showed me that uh, looked at the inventory. And I thought the, um, the indexes, if I'm reading that correctly, is talking about supply and demand. Yeah. How much demand there is, how much inventory there is, and the difference between REITs, I assume you mean publicly traded or all REITs? Non-traded. Non-traded REITs. Yeah. Um, and business development corporations. Can you uh, expand on that a little? Yeah, so that index is is really what it does is it takes a look at what all of, because these are registered products with the SEC, mm-hmm. and so they have a certain size that they register to go out and try to raise that capital in that offering itself. And so this index really kind of takes a look at, looks back and says, how long will it take at the current run rate Mm -hmm. for us to sell out all of the registered product that is currently available in in that sector? And what you see is, you used to see the cycles of of what is popular at the given time. And and obviously, uh, non-traded REITs have, um, over the last couple of years, have seen a drop in overall sales. And uh, so that index that uh, we're looking at right now, there is 24 years of inventory that's currently available based off of the current amount that's being raised. Wow. So if they stopped registering product today, you'd Mm -hmm. still have 24 years of product available Mm -hmm. for the industry to go out and buy at the current run rate. And then if you look at the BDCs, um, it is less than two years. Mm So if you go back and you look, basically go back almost seven years, mm-hmm. you would have those numbers would be reverse. Right. So you see this, you see the cycles of the different sectors and the different products. Well, and also the as you expanded on earlier, the business development corporations, um, the movement there, it, 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 it it's private debt. It's, it's private debt, and because rising yeah. of the interest rates, a lot of people go out there and, yeah. and uh, on that. So when money was cheap with interest rates low. 
uh, you know, the it was much better for the non-traded REITs versus it being mm -hmm. for a BDC. So it was a little bit reverse. Very good. A um, lot of sponsors, a lot of movement there. Um, I think just touching on one, which was uh, uh, surprising to me a little bit, is the, the movement of uh, Blackstone. I mean, they're still the 900-pound gorilla, but um, they're getting caught up. Somebody's nipping at their heels. Yeah, so Blackstone uh, Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, they call it B-REIT, uh, is one of the largest REITs in the world. Uh, and they have raised a tremendous amount of money since they launched, probably going back almost four years ago. And it was interesting that this was the first month going back since inception of B-REIT that they were outsold by a competitor mm -hmm. where they actually normally had 75% market share. Mm -hmm. And so I found that that would be a very, very uh, compelling story to kind of take a look at and why. And so I do think that sometimes uh, just because you're the largest doesn't mean you're the best out there. Well, and there are problems that come with being the largest. There is. There I is. Mean, I mean, sometimes when there's, uh, you know, uh, people need some liquidity, mm -hmm. there's a run on the bank and they have to, you know, uh, either cap it or uh, limit it to amount. Yeah. And so uh, there's a lot of different... Um, you're also raising too much money. You have to place that money accretively yeah. as well. So are you able to buy just a single standing building or do you have to go out and buy a public company and take them private, right. depending on how much money you have to place? Well, you mentioned uh, the Yale or Harvard endowments. I think it was David Swinson was the uh, Yale. Yes. The Yale yep. guy. Uh -huh. um, and they and, and Warren Buffett, you know, with Berkshire Hathaway, they all have that same problem. They have so doggone much money when Warren Buffett wants to get into a railroad stock. He has to buy the whole railroad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, certain um, certain problems that come with that. So um, let's see. Uh, share repurchase plans. Um, that do you think that trend is uh, is slowed down or leveled off at this point? I, I do. Yeah. Okay. I do. So that's just an opportunity for when you have a non liquid investment. They have uh, different features built in um, where uh, the share repurchase plans allow investors, if something does come up mm -hmm. where they need to have some access to their capital, it gives them that ability to tap into that mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, uh, get some of their money back out um, with that. And so when we ran into a... Uh, two years ago when we ran into the high interest rates and uh, uh, people were seeking you know income they needed more of their income um, they were looking at their investments and tapping into their investments to try to get them some yep. some additional liquidity and um, uh, but I do think that that is kind of leveled off now looking at the industry well when we look at the amount of money that's gone into uh, REITs we've we've talked a lot about REITs we don't work a whole lot with REITs we don't we, we, uh, uh, there's several things I don't like about them. I, as a uh, financial planner, I like to know exactly what I'm investing in generally. Yep. And that's one of the real advantages with what we refer to as the Delaware Statutory Trust, which is uh, still a, a small industry. I mean, it, last year was the third greatest uh, sales and it was only about $5 billion. Yep. So uh, this, it looks like this year we're on, on track to surpass that. We have a, uh, a very happy new client uh, who was uh, coming very close to going into, I think, uh, one of the big box, one of these dollar store kind of things recently. Yep. And uh, he was being pitched very aggressively by you know a salesman, uh, a broker. Um, who is saying, oh, it's got a 15-year lease on it, and, it, you know, it's, it's great. It's a triple net. They're taking care of everything. Um, and then we had news recently how uh, the, a lot of the dollar stores are being closed by one of the companies. Yeah. Uh, something like 1,000 stores or 12. Over 1,000 stores. So um, now we have clients who are in Delaware Statutory Trust that own some dollar-type stores. Yep. But they're very good at their management. So that's a, that's a segue into perhaps you talking about the cues a little bit. How come we were comfortable with our dollar store, dollar type store uh, investments uh, not, and we didn't see our people get hurt? Well, I mean, uh, there's risks in almost anything, and actually sure. there's risks of actually owning real estate as well. But we, what we uh, have the benefit of looking at is, we, what I always look at is what I call the three Qs. Mm -hmm. And it's the quality of the sponsor, it's the quality of the sector itself, and the quality of the income. 
And so when we go back and we say, okay, well, let's look at the sponsors that we want to work with. There's currently right now probably over 50 sponsors in the industry that are offering a variety of different products out there. We probably work with 15 to 20 of them. Mm-hmm. At most, yeah. And uh, at most. And what we really like to look at is these sponsors are institutional quality. They have been in business for 10 to 15 years. They've stayed true to their investment philosophy mm-hmm. in the sense that they are, if you're, if, if I'm, if I'm a sponsor and I'm selling multifamily, I'm staying in that sector mm-hmm. over that 15, 20 years. We want to take a look at what their track record is, how their cycles, um, if you've been in business for 25 years, you've seen many cycles, ups and downs, and mm-hmm. some recessions. How did your portfolio hold up during those recessions, and what did you do for those investors? Because you might have some problem programs, and we want to take a look at that. Then we look at the sector itself. Um, we There's a variety of different sectors out there, and we've stayed cleared of, uh, knock on wood, of some of the sectors mm-hmm. that we've stayed cleared on. So well, Earlier on, you mentioned the strongest three right now were industrial, multifamily, and senior housing. Yeah, so uh, a lot of those sectors, um, it, it, so nothing is recession-proof, but what we really want to try to look at is what sectors are recession resistant, mm-hmm. meaning that do, are they staying open even during COVID? What sectors were staying open even during COVID and cash flowing? Everybody assumed that the world was shut down, which it was, but there were some businesses that were still open and some businesses that mm-hmm. were still performing extremely well. For example, if you look at the large multifamily offerings that were out there, um, they had the best performance mm-hmm. in, during COVID yeah. than, than any other sector in time, and you, you're, you're wondering, why is that? A lot of it had to do with, um, on the large multifamily, they had Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac debt, which is Mm government-owned. The government allowed them to, if any of the tenants got let go because of COVID, they could not kick them out. Mm -hmm. And then they could just deduct that from their debt service payment that they would make. So most of these large multifamilies were running 100% occupied, 100% of revenue, Mm -hmm. where if you looked at a lot of the small mom and pop owned triplex and duplexes oh, and sure. things they were going broke yeah. because they didn't know what to do yeah. so um we look, even uh, to that point even if the same rules and laws applied to them they couldn't get the financing and knowing how to navigate it knowing even how to proceed down that they didn't have a, a strong corporate staff because uh, again the quality of the sponsor right yeah and so um and and most of these are we keep we keep going back to it it's it's a mom and pop couldn't get the same terms of the debt financing mm-hmm. with through Fannie Mae Freddie Mac because a lot of it has to do with the size of your complex. Yeah. So if if you're a mom and pop that own uh, six or seven units, mm-hmm. these institutions own 300, 350, 400 units. You know mm-hmm. complexes. Yeah. So size so, matters. So size matters yeah. on that. So that that's one that uh, that worked out well. Um, so we look at the quality of the sponsor and and their tenure. We also look at the quality of the sector. Some that we've avoided as well as office. We've avoided office. Mm-hmm. We've avoided hospitality. We really avoided actually student housing during the COVID time just because, you know, uh, kids were actually working from home and going to school mm-hmm. at home, and, and those buildings were left uh, dark as well. Sure. A lot of our clients need that monthly income. They mm-hmm. live off that monthly income, and we want to make sure that that monthly income is not interrupted whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So we really take pride in a lot of the sectors that we actually focus in on, that it's that it's not recession proof, but it's recession and COVID resistant. resistant. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, student housing. That's an interesting one. Um, and I uh, I like student housing under certain circumstances. Yeah. I like certain I like student housing. First of all, applying your three cues to it. Okay. Um, if the sponsor is familiar and an expert in student housing. Right. You know, just because you've done great in storage units doesn't mean you can just flip over now and start doing student housing and do well with that. Yep. So staying in their lane and not, not having mission creep where they think that, you know, it's, it's hubris to say that, gee, I'm good at this, so I'm going to be good at everything, right? Yep. Um, so, uh, but some of the 
I mean, the nuance, every sector has its nuance. Yeah, student housing is performing well right now. I mean, one of the benefits of the student housing is you have basically a 12-month guarantee lease that, mm -hmm. uh, that the parents have to actually sign, mm -hmm. and, and so you have someone on the lease itself. That's one of the requirements we would want if we're looking at That's evaluating exactly a project. And then making sure that that dorm is on campus and not off campus mm -hmm. sometimes, which is the benefit as well, because a lot of students, you know, especially the first, you know, uh, freshmen or sophomores all mm -hmm. require to stay on the dorm side. So you uh, typically would have 100% uh, occupancy for a 12 month period of time as PGs, well. PGs, parental guarantees. That's, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, what parents. you would not want is to be in a, um, a heavily regulated city, for example, at a city college where the college itself is renting your whole building. Correct. Because now you're under the thumb right. of their rent controls or legislation. Yeah, so, you, so we take a look at all the, yeah. all, all the, all the different nuances. Yeah. So I, you know, I, don't, I don't want to throw them into saying, that we, you know, we, we avoided them during COVID because yeah. they suffered during that time, yeah. but student housing is coming back and, they're, they're, and, and uh, there's some great opportunities in there. Uh, they're paying some great yields as well, and, and, you, and you get quite a bit of upside as well. We've seen some good ones we're looking at uh, out, in the, out in the Midwest, where smaller schools, mm -hmm. where, um, again, all of those things. One of, the, one of the keys is kids tend to be hard on property, so you're going to need to have a little bit uh, more reserve built in yep. uh, for your reserves in the private placement memorandum. So, yep. um, and then, yeah. and then the last thing we take a look at is the quality of the income. Who's paying the rent? Mm -hmm. And it's really the strength of the tenant. And yep. so uh, investment grade tenants, we want to take a look at them and uh, how, long have, how long is the lease terms? What's the terms of the lease? So there's a lot of different things that we take a look at so that that m monthly distribution check going to our investors is not interrupted whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so um, those, are the, uh, those are the three cues that we take a look at on top of a variety of different other things that uh, on due diligence wise, but those are really the three main ones that we take a look at. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, the types of buyers that we see when interest rates went up, shifting gears here a little bit, when interest rates went up so, uh, so abruptly, that slowed a lot of people down. What I found is that investors are comfortable and happy dealing in a medium that they like, real estate, for example, mm -hmm. or energy, or we talk about BDCs, various things. It's kind of like, okay, what's the steady state? Where are things at? Now I'm going to do what I do. I invest in this area. When people get scared of the market, or scared of investing and not sure what to do is when change is actively happening. When interest rates are going up too quickly, they stand off. If interest rates are dropping quickly, they're thinking, well, I'm going to wait until they get, until they settle down. So with that, I mean, interest rates now have been um, reasonably stable for a while. And we, I feel that's one of the reasons we feel people coming back into the market now. Yes. Uh, there were people who were cash buyers who sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Um, cash commercial buyers, um, folks who are, you know, uh, going through a divorce or a partnership's breaking up or somebody dies. Um, so those buyers, I think, always have to be. Yep. And so, you know, absolutely right. So when interest rates were actually uh, steadily increasing over a period of time, a uh, typical person is probably going to sit on the sidelines and mm -hmm. see what happens with the interest rates because they can price themselves out really pretty quickly because if they have a debt, you know, of 3% on an mm -hmm. interest rate, and then if they sell and then they have to go back into the market and they're going to be paying 7 8%, that, that's, it's upside down. doesn't that's make right. sense. But uh, we have seen a lot of people that are, you know, large commercial uh, owners of commercial grade properties that were all cash that see an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they, they basically want to do a 1031 exchange because they want to lock in their gain and, and maybe buy in a different sector in a different space. We also unfortunately see some of the other people that uh, either their partnership or their businesses are breaking up mm -hmm. or uh, someone going through divorce and they have a large portfolio of single family rentals or duplexes. And those are forced sales because they have to. They have mm -hmm. to divide those assets. And uh, regardless of interest rates, they, they make those transactions. So we're here to help facilitate those and, and making sure that they do w what is best for them individually mm -hmm. as well in that given time and environment. Well, and I think that's one of the, uh, not to pat ourselves on the back too much, but that's always where we start. We want to know where are, is the 
client or the prospect right now? What's the situation? Where are they trying to get to? What is this? What's success? How do they say, man, this is what's going on and I just wish I was here. That's our job is to help them get from here to there. So you can find that some people want a property or an investment that's going to maximize their current cash flow. That's what they need. They need current income. We have some who say, keep the income. I don't want it. I'd like that to get reinvested in the property. Okay. So before we can, I mean, those are poles apart as far as what their goals are and what the ultimate uh, portfolio solution should be for them. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we really enjoy is stepping back a little bit and saying, let's not focus on, hey, I sold this, I got to buy that. Let's focus on what are we really trying to accomplish overall. Well, that, that was one of the things that really kind of attracted me when you and I started to work together is because you take a look at the overall picture and the overall financial goal mm -hmm. and an analysis where there's a lot of people out there in the industry that's just looking to do a transaction. Yeah. And so I, I can't tell you how many times we actually have gone through the full-blown financial plan and, and, and basically recommend to them, you don't need a DST. Yeah. You know, this is what you need over mm -hmm. here and we can fix your issue or, you know, there's there's some other ways uh, right. and they're shocked because they're saying, well, you're not going to sell me something. Well, that's not what you need right now. Right. Um, and, or we'll and, go through, we'll look at a DST and then we'll see that, oh, my gosh, looking at a tax return, there's such a way you could be saving lots of money over here just by this nuance in the tax return. Um, not to pick on CPAs, but uh, we have our own in-house uh, tax company, separate company, tax which sets, company. Which sets us apart from everybody else. Because, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Because, they, it, it, I mean, how nice is it to actually uh, lean on your internal CPA team mm -hmm. that you have uh, that is out there doing yeah. uh, tax returns for our existing clients and business owners? Well, and, and the taxes with regards to alternative investments are frankly um, a little bit more complicated than yep. what you're going to take down to H&R Block. Yep. So we're, we're very able to help that. Um, let's see, just a couple last things here. The risk mitigation. I know you talked about the three Qs. Uh, we talked about um, the different levels of due diligence that, again, our tax department separates us from a lot of the, the salesmen out there who are trying to have a transaction. Yeah. Um, I believe that your experience, your background in due diligence and your background in the industry uh, we, we take that very seriously. So when we look at the, the levels of due diligence, when you go through a process either of acquiring or uh, syndicating a new DST, you've got, I think we were talking about that earlier, you've got the, the, the sponsor, you've got the bank, you've got all the different parties, but then it still comes down to us where you're running through saying, okay, now all of these other people have done their due diligence on it. They have vetted it mm -hmm. with top, accounting firms and banks and all of theirs, but now let's take a look at it. Let's really look at the, the placement memorandum and let's look at what uh, what does their pro forma look like going out. Yep. And that's where you've taught me a, a fair amount of the nuance of like the difference between having a, a back to student have as a housing, having one that is the university owns a master contract on the whole building or whether you actually have parental guarantees for 12 months on all of them. That's such a small but huge nuance. On to, the outcome, yeah. At yeah, the, at on the, the back outcome. End. Yeah. So typically on these, these types of investments, there's really four levels of due diligence that's being done on the underwriting of this asset. So a sponsor who is buying the property is going to do um, their own underwriting and risk analysis on that property before they actually put it into an offering. If they add debt to it, they have to bring in their lender, mm -hmm. and that lender has to do their own um, underwriting to make sure before they actually lend money on that property itself and get an appraisal, third-party appraisal. So that underwriting, let's say it goes all the way through and they put it together. Then that sponsor goes out and hires a third-party, independent third-party law firm or um, due diligence firm that mm -hmm. does a third independent third party report on all their own underwriting and all the documents to say everything checks out. Mm -hmm. uh, this everything you say that you said that this offering is going to do, we, we believe it can do it. And then it goes to the broker dealer community, and every broker dealer has to do their own level of due diligence on top mm -hmm. of that as well. Our broker dealer has an approved product list. We probably focus in on 10 to 15 of those different products and sponsors. We don't sell all of them because we do our own due diligence mm -hmm. on top of that. And so I've been fortunate where I've been in this business over 30 years. 
uh, both as an analyst in real estate, commercial real estate, and then also on the sponsor side mm -hmm. in doing the underwriting as well. And it is, uh, so you get to know, you know, over those 30 years, we've seen ups and downs of the different markets and uh, recessions and um, COVID mm -hmm. and, and how the different sectors react as well. And so we've been able to um, avoid some of those challenges, I think, mm -hmm. that, are, that are currently out there for a lot of our existing clients and investors. So we've been uh, uh, very fortunate in doing that. And we rely to, on each other as a team. I mean, we have the accounting team, we have the, the tax team, we have the financial planning team, and then you and ourselves. So it goes to our investment committee, and then we, mm -hmm. we make a decision on what's best for us to offer to our clients. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pleased when I see hardships come along, like with COVID, for example. One of our, uh, uh, our clients, for the most part, were um, enjoying a fairly peaceful time during all of that. We had a, uh, uh, I think the most risky uh, element was one of our sponsors had a, uh, had a hotel that they had just opened up as far as a new DST, a new investment, and it was a big branded hotel. Um, it was, uh, you know, I'm not gonna name the name, but it, but it reminded me of having two trees, you know, in, uh, on, yeah. the, on, the, on the badge. Um, in a great area. In a fantastic area. Yeah. So um, it was uh, great the way that company handled it. First of all, they had the experience. Second of all, they had the size to say, okay, something's happening out there. That's okay. We're going to quit collecting any management fees. We're going to downgrade the distribution a little bit, but we're going to protect your principal, your investment. And they've done great. They they it's, weathered the storm. They came back, back. They it's turned exceeded, it back on. It's exceeded, it exceeded their projections currently in their PPM Absolutely. right now as well. And so investors yeah. have made it all back. And, and a so, lesser company or somebody who was newly trying to get into that area might have had might have had trouble might not have been able to do that I agree with so you. I agree with that you was that. a heck of a success story in yep. spite of a short interruption yep. or, talk, talk a little bit about uh, during these during the, these last you know the run-up on inflation with some of the strategies that you've put into place here at the firm with the with the planners in working with the current clientele because I think that's so unique in the sense some of the strategies that you've implemented uh, for the benefit of a lot of the clients um, yeah, thanks, Rich. The, you know, our approach, I, I guess a good way to compare it would be to contrast it to, I mentioned earlier, tenant in common or uh, triple net properties. Um, let's say that you own, uh, you buy a, a store, it could be a coffee shop, it could be a drug store, it could be one of the big chains, and you own this whole thing, and you, you own the property and you're leasing it out in a triple net. That means that the tenant is taking care of all the expenses on the property. So you own the property, they're taking care of all of it, and they have a lease that may be a 15-year lease with successive five-year options after that. At paying the rent, and then it bumps up, and it bumps up again, that's I have not seen that where that is indexed to inflation, okay? So if you put your money and buy a triple net property or you put it into something that is, has a long, long-term lease, back when interest rates were essentially zero, when they were so low, um, that was a nice selling feature, being able to say, this is great, it's got a long-term lease, it's got some uh, red escalations in it. But with inflation, it's out of control. Right now, if you go into the grocery store with a $100 bill, that would be the equivalent of four years ago going into the grocery store with, a, with 75 bucks. Okay, That's how much in four years we've eroded 24% of our purchasing power. Okay, well, what if you had a property that you bought back in 2020 and that you were getting good income off of it that was fixed, that was flat, that wasn't able to adjust with inflation? Okay, you still have that income coming in, but now things are 24% more expensive. Okay, so that's the downside of long term leases that generally are packaged with a lot of the. Um, well, some of the industrial, for example, that we've talked about. I think industrial can be great. I think long-term leases can be nice. But what instead if you had uh, student housing, okay, or 
not that I'm pushing that, but let's say student health, let's say long-term uh, care or uh, senior living, memory care, storage units. Um, I, I mentioned the student housing, multifamily, residential, that sort of thing. What's common with every one of those things? What's common with all of those is that it's very granular, it's shorter, the ultimate tenant, it's a short-term commitment. So that means that their lease comes up each year or with a storage unit every few months or six months or a year. Every time that lease comes up, the owner and the operator has an opportunity to mark that rental rate to the market. So now we've got built-in inflation protection. Again, it's not inflation proof, it's not recession proof, as you mentioned earlier, but it's built in inflation protection by having the shorter term element of the of the lease. So yeah. we feel a proper portfolio should have a combination, should be diversified across sponsor, across geography, across market sector. But I think a real element is you want to have some part of your portfolio that's designed to be in, uh, inflation resistant. Yeah. And we also do quite a bit in the sense of looking at some of that uh, accelerated depreciation a little mm -hmm. bit, don't you, with yes. and working with some of your clients? Mm -hmm. Okay. We do, and that's something for folks who, you know, getting into the weeds a little bit, but if you have single family or if you have residential rental, typically you're going to see that depreciated at 27 and a half years. If you have commercial property, it's typically going to depreciate straight line over a 39-year period, okay? Um, what most of the, well, I would say a, a, a plurality of the DSTs do is what's called a cost segregation analysis that lets them accelerate depreciation. And that's why uh, typically they're like a five to seven year hold. We have some DSTs that are as short as two or three years that offer some liquidity at that point or have gone what's called full cycle to where you can now move on to your next investment. Yep. So they're optimized for taxes. Um, a, a good financial planner, and we're financial planners in our firm. We're certified financial planners, uh, charter financial consultants, which incidentally, not because of regulation, but because of the charter of the financial planner, they, to be that designation, you have to approach every interaction with clients as a fiduciary. Okay, fiduciary word gets bandied about a lot in the industry and I think misused tremendously. Uh, but when you are working with a CFP, a CHFC, you are working with somebody that based on their charter, not on regulation, but the charter of their designation, they have to uh, deal with everybody as a fiduciary. So we find that financial planners, the, the best way to approach any of this is what are you trying to accomplish has to come first. And that really is the purpose. And then from that, you do the planning. And the planning involves whether what's the income and the expenses and the taxes, multi-generational planning, and all of that stuff. Health, how long do you plan on living? Um, you want to be able to accomplish your purpose with the right planning, and then only then will that really help define what portfolio solutions you should be looking at. Right. So that, that really is, is our approach. It's purpose planning and portfolio, and it's a whole lot more than just saying, hey, you sold something, you want to buy something? Yep. That's, that's not, uh, in our opinion, that's not a fiduciary way to, to well, deal with a, a client. That, that, that's a transaction. Yeah. And then they're just looking to do one trade and move on yeah. and not really take a look at the overall picture yeah. as well. And I think that, that that bodes well because a lot of the success stories that I've always enjoyed working with, uh, with, uh, with the clients here are ones that we've taken from other financial planners or other, oh, yeah. other advisors that they have been put into a, a, a bunch of different products yeah. that don't make sense to them and it's a, like a puzzle and so yeah. when they go through that process and then we start to strategize a little bit and develop a portfolio for them they sit back and they look at it and that's now it makes sense now it makes sense yeah. to them yeah well you know one of the things we believe you'll hear us say it around here a lot is that a good financial planner will lead you down as few one-way streets as possible right going to keep your options open for you and uh as we are reviewing the work product or portfolios, which is usually a collection of stuff that uh, folks bring into us, I'll regularly, I'll say, well, why do you own this? Whatever it is. And the most common answer I get is, well, that's what the guy I was working with was selling. 
not, oh, well, this satisfies my income and it's going to mature here. It's going to give me a liquidity event there. They have no idea. Yeah. And, and that's okay. It's not their job. I'm not an expert in whatever their career was. And so we, we really help provide a structure that people can believe in the structure and how, how all that works. And, and certainly the alternative investments are getting to be a stronger and stronger you know, part of the, whole, of the whole mix. So Rich Arnitz, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on today. And, uh, well, thanks for having me. Glad we got to do this. And we'll probably do it again uh, oh, a quarter from now. Sounds great. All Look right. forward to it. Thank you, Wally. Thank you. Impact 31 is a DBA of Retweet Financial LLC. Not an offer to buy nor a solicitation to sell securities. All investing involves risk. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Speak to your finance and or tax professional prior to investing. Securities offered through Emerson Equity LLC. Member FINRA SIPC. Only available in states where Emerson Equity LLC is registered. Emerson Equity LLC is not affiliated with any other entities identified in this communication. Investment advisory services offered through AE Wealth Management. Emerson Equity, Retweet Financial, and AE Wealth Management are not affiliated companies.